What were you doing 30 years ago? That was going to be my opening statement until I saw the children from Woodcroft uh, <laughs> Secondary School. And I thought, actually, they probably got left reference point about 30 years ago than most of you. But I guess in that generation, you're going to be able to solve those problems, and you're probably going to have a shot at answering that in the future. Welcome. 30 years ago, that's when I started my working career. 30 years ago, we would send a telex to Europe and get an answer if we were lucky the next day. 30 years ago, the typing pool ruled the roost. And we thought liquid paper was a good use of time. And innovation 30 years ago was the introduction of a blue one, a green one, a yellow one, and a pink one, so you could cover over all the mistakes you made on all of the carbon copies through the paper. Times have changed. I admit to being an Essen supporter and to be proud of that. In 1980, there was a little journey that commenced. The coach took over the team at Essendon and had a vision and began a journey. It took him five years to win his first premiership. But he had a vision about the future. After it, he said, it took five years to play four quarters of football, but I'm patient. He got there. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about today is about getting somewhere, but it depends on us having a shared vision. 30 years ago, when I started work, the first commercial internet was available. The first mobile phone network existed. I can remember engineers in Europe telling me, well, a mobile phone can never actually be shorter than this distance, because that's the distance between the ear and the mouth. Pretty wrong. Bill Gates introduced Microsoft 30 years ago. Microsoft operating system. Storing away from a personal computer on a network started 30 years ago. The first Macintosh was available 30 years ago. And we used to sign at school, or uh, sorry, at work, to take it home overnight and to practice. And there were two in the entire company that we could sign for. Importantly, those technologies were conceived a generation before they were put on the market at that point in time. We're about to go on another journey. Journey's actually starting. The Europeans, particularly the Germans, commissioned a report, and it's not from any individual company, it was from the research union in Germany, to give the Germans a vision for the future of manufacturing. What would industry look like way into the future? If you do that, if you create a vision for tomorrow, you will come with a little incremental change. If you create a vision that's 30, 40 years out, you don't have any barriers. There's nothing to prevent you creating something completely new. This particular uh, journey, uh, is called the Journey to Industry 4.0, the fourth industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution was the mechanical steam industrial revolution. The second was the production line, Model T Fords, sequential production in the electrified world. The third industrial revolution was where automation and IT was introduced to assist in production, in manufacturing. What on earth is the fourth? We've done it all. The fourth is the cyber-physical world. The cyber-physical world of interaction in the production environment between the product being manufactured and the manufacturing equipment. You might ask now, why do we need that? Why can't we just keep things the way they are and just optimise? Well, the reality is the world has become global. And we're exposed to all sorts of competition from around the globe. And I'll repeat it later, but I'll say it now. That's not a risk, that's a fantastic opportunity. We as Australians always talked about the tyranny of distance as being some sort of excuse or barrier for not being great on a global stage, because we're too far away. 
Think about the world today of the internet. Think about the speed of communication. Not sending a telex now and getting it back a day later if you're lucky and then miscommunication. This is fluid communication happening. Our ability to participate in the world thinking on any topic or the world manufacturing is greater than it's ever been before. But it's only great if we see manufacturing differently to what it is today and see our role in manufacturing as part of the global supply chain. I'll say a few words about that in a moment. Tonsley. You've all come to this place called Tonsley. It's a very modern way of thinking. I think it's a fantastic initiative by the South Australian state to say the future of the world in a complex world of Industry 4.0 require immense collaboration. And I think it's poetic in a way that we have the roof still existing of the old Mitsubishi plant here, and yet we have a TAFE college at one end, Flinders University at the other, and we have all sorts of technology companies in this environment saying, you know what, it's far better to collaborate with people to generate new ideas and leverage off other industries to develop what we need to develop, rather than sitting in our offices somewhere in the city with security around the front and keeping our secrets to ourselves. So Industry 4.0 is tremendous complexity, which requires tremendous collaboration. So if you accept that the world is becoming globalised, and has heavy impact on, digital da on digits, data, ones and zeros. What does the competitive playing field look like in that future? And I'll try to give you a few snapshots of the thoughts of things that we see changing that exist now, but will evolve, and I challenge the children there from Woodcroft Primary to go out and answer the questions for the future, maybe Industry 5.0. Cyber-physical world is the world of customised mass production. And let me try to explain that to you to say, take a BMW scenario. 30 years ago, BMW had five base models with a limited number of options. Today, there are 12 base model series with hundreds of preset combinations that you could order from a configurator. Is that personalised mass production? No, it's not. Personalised mass production is talking about I want to have my car, not in your standard, I want to have the, the mudguards a little bit more flared and I want to have, what's your football club? What's your football club, favourite football club? Port, Port Adelaide. I want my Port Adelaide colours on that car. I don't like the exhaust pipe, I'd like to have it this shape. And you put it in the system and through the production line it produces your car. Right then, exactly the way you like it infinite mass production, where the actual engineering piece behind will tell the production system, not in a, in a, a pretty fine way, but in a fluid way, what is to be produced. Additive manufacturing, often spoken about, and I'm, I'm sure in these four walls, um, there's all sorts of fantastic examples of what can be done with additive manufacturing. Additive, additive manufacturing, will change logistics change, particularly in the area of spare parts. What does it mean? You can make complex items, complex shapes, anywhere in the world. Manufacturing of those parts in the future then is not about some production line sitting in Germany, for example, but rather the software packet that, get, that gets sent to the additive manufacturing machine, let's say sitting in South Australia a shared services manufacturing machine. Your software packet goes on that machine and that machine takes the necessary powders, the composites, the material science of tomorrow and says this particular, if it's a turbine blade, you can see it up there on the, on the right hand side, that turbine re blade requires a composite in the following powders, the powders get put onto the additive manufacturing machine and out comes the blade. Think about what that changes in the world in terms of logistics chains. You no longer have the delay of months while this thing gets waiting for its production sequence somewhere in a major mass-scale uh, mass factory, 
but rather the boxes are stored around the globe with the powders that are necessary, ready. Tremendous consequence. For those that hadn't heard, read this morning's newspaper, the Avalon Air Show in Melbourne was taking place and some students from the Monash University were showing their additive manufacturing jet engine that they had just completed. A complete jet engine done with additive manufacturing in the garage. Highly digitalized, highly detailed manufacturing. The opportunities are limitless. Now I would say the need for speed, the need for Australia to see its competitive advantage of tomorrow, not as being a manufacturer, and I say manufacturing is engineering and design, the, the dominant part of manufacturing, you rather actually have to see in Australia for Australia, but in Australia for the world. Because people outside of Australia are actually seeing their manufacturing for the world. So it is a race, it is a competition. And I think most Australians would all say, you know when Australians are best? When we're competing. The opportunities really are ours to take. Digital factory. So, to be competitive you must eliminate waste. You can't have non-conformance costs. You have to have the quality up first time. And in the Industry 4.0 world, this particular shot is of the, the German Chancellor at a factory in uh, Germany, an automation factory. It makes automation equipment. But the equipment that makes the automation equipment, okay, is actually already self-correcting, self-optimizing. It can sense when something's getting out of tolerance and adjust. It exists already, it's coming. The challenge for Australia is how do we play in that? How do we do the engineering packets that might be interesting for that? In the automotive industry here in South Australia, is it correct to say we are no longer in the automotive industry? No, it's not at all. If you use the engineering tools that these uh, large organisations globally are using on their platforms, you can contribute still to the automotive industry. And what's more, the skills you have are not limited to the automotive industry, they are applicable across all industries. The opportunities are immense. We talked about uh, the, the digital world, uh, and here we talk about avatars. And if you talk about whole of life, it's very well to manufacture a jet engine, but the first time you have to go and service that thing, you say, oh, damn, I can't get that spanner in that place in a, in a, in a human way to maintain it. The simulation that happens using human avatars that will have to service those final creations is so detailed now that you can fully predict what will happen through the whole of a life of a piece of equipment, and you can design in at the front end what you need to prevent that problem happening six, seven, eight years later. And the perfect example of that, if you want a generational example, would be the Collins class submarine. Today, to repair the Collins class submarine, you actually have to cut to get the motor out, you actually have to cut the back off the thing and put a new one in. This is not cheap. Mars Rover. An example of digitization, an example of simulation. The, 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 the actual craft that went to Mars, landed on Mars, was the prototype. There was no other physical prototype made. It was done in a software environment and it was done with the contribution of people from all over the globe to specific parts on that Mars rover. The notion that Australia can't participate in what is manufacturing of the future is nonsense. Virtual collaboration. So with all those tools happening on the globe, um, it's possible for employees from all over the world who have an experience in a plant somewhere in South America or in Europe or in Australia to watch the new production line being designed and actually tag a specific place that they work in and say, you know what, this would be done better if it was done this way, not that way. 
And in real time, the, the simulation of what would happen and what the consequence of that would be um, uh, gets updated in the system. Digitisation. This is Snowtown 2 wind farm in South Australia, the largest wind farm of its type with the most modern technology in the, in the actual turbines, direct drive turbines, less moving parts, less room for error. There are 800 measurements happening in that uh, equipment constantly that are fed into global centres to measure vibration, to measure heat, to measure, to measure noise, to be able to optimise what's happening on that wind farm. I mentioned already um, the submarine topic, and I feel very, very passionate about two things. One, of course, Australia needs the sovereign capability to have a submarine that suits our purpose for the nation. But where we spend a tremendous amount of money on such a piece of infrastructure, and it's a highly technical, complex piece of infrastructure, hundreds of items in that submarine, subsystems, that need to work together. It's a tremendous opportunity to change our way of manufacturing. Skills for the future, competing in the global supply chain. Can we hook into the global manufacturer, no matter where he is, and contribute to the design? Can we be part of the whole of life? Answer's absolutely yes. So, to close, a few more thoughts. Manufacturing of the future is much more about the intellectual input. It's much less about the hammer and the wrench, and much more about the digital design. But even in that environment, employee contributions are still contributing to the most productivity gains. Without the, the human brain, to look at things inquisitively and say, I can do it differently. We won't get continuing productivity gains. So should we just wait for 4.0 to happen? The answer is no, it's on its way and we've got to get on board and we've got to learn. We've got to learn what it takes to be part of that new world of the digital uh, production. Leave you with a quote. In, in this industry, success can depend on a fraction of a second. Sort of emotionless does that create in you? Winning, urgency, competition. And they're the same emotions that I've just been describing in the last 15 minutes. And actually that one came from Red Bull, the head mechanic of Red Bull. The reason that Red Bull are extremely successful is because their whole view on product life cycle simulation and whole of life of that car means that their cycle times are faster than anybody else's. 4.0 is a long-term commitment, but it is a race, and I say we have to get on board and go quickly. Thank you.